Um, before I start, what, one thing you mentioned about Casa Pound, there was a house Montag. Before Casa Pound became Casa Pound, it was Casa Montag. So that has to be a connection, right? That they're very directly seeing themselves as autonomous, extreme right, which started as a, a kind of housing squad and, and, and so forth. Um, although I'm nominally English is my first language, uh, sort of, I'm going to read my paper because uh, uh, I'm not nearly as good a speaker as, as, as Bernhard is. Um, but really, uh, this is going to be an unashamedly qualitative talk, whereas uh, we saw a lot of detail there. This is going to be based, uh, to some extent, on my own uh, experiences of testifying against neo-Nazism in uh, Britain. And just by way of preface, I, I firmly agree with you that we could talk about, without drawing too uh, direct a line, a kind of fourth generation of neo-Nazism, if we talk about a generation of 20 years, right around the turn of the 21st century, there were new ways of doing neo-Nazism, and I, I, I hope that my um, talk sort of reinforces that, and I'm going to be talking about what usually goes by lone wolf, but I think that's a little bit valorizing, uh, self-activating terrorism, as you can see I defined there. And really I'm going to be focusing on two words um, that may or may not work in this context, which is active and passive. I hope to unpack that distinction by looking at um, what I'm going to call terrorist networks of support. And I'm going to look at a couple of case studies that derive from, from my experience of testifying against neo-Nazis and maybe is applicable not just to the so-called lone wolves, but maybe to the experience of terrorism a little bit more uh, generally. So with that kind of definition in mind, um, I'm going to start by giving you a couple of examples that you are likely familiar with. There's David Copeland at the top and Martin Gilliard uh, bottom right. Um, now certainly in terms of self-activating lone wolf terrorism, there's no doubt that uh, extreme uh, right-wing actors have historically been the, the largest practitioner of this. Uh, it started as an uh, anarchist uh, uh, um, tactic in the late 19th, mid to late 19th century. Uh, really died out for nearly a century and was taken up again with the plum for many of the reasons that Bernhard set up. It was too easy to interdict traditional organizations. Um, there was a sense of no longer uh, respecting the rule of law and wanting a violent overthrow of society. And in recent years, we've seen um, in Britain the real possibility of would-be Breviks, as you saw in my first slide there. Uh, that's Anders Bering Brevik. Killed 77 people, of course, on the 22nd of July, 2011. Most of them children, and most of them killed at very short distance, execution style, uh, on the island of uh, Utoya, which is the bottom uh, right there. Uh, but there's been a number of uh, attempted would-be Breviks, would-be Copelands, uh, in the last uh, 10 or so years. The two case studies I'm going to give you today uh, failed to carry out their plans, uh, but it wasn't for want of trying, uh, as I'm going to set out in this presentation. Um, the first thing I think we need to uh, disabuse ourselves of is that lone wolves or, or self-activating terrorists are not necessarily hermits. They're not necessarily people who have no connection with the outside world. Um, they instead have, uh, a, like I said, a, a network of support with like-minded like extremists, and this has uh, been absolutely redoubled uh, with the growth of online uh, uh, worlds and imaginaries. So these networks of support, as I call them, and what I'm going to argue today is that they can be either active or passive networks of support. And it seems to me key in the process of uh, terrorist radicalization, or what sometimes is called the terrorist cycle. So I argued in that paper in 2013, if this idea of complete and total isolation were a defining feature of lone wolf terrorism, Perhaps the only real lone wolf terrorist would be the so-called Unabomber, Theodore Kaczynski, who literally lived out in Montana, had no contact with anyone, and was sending letter bombs in the United States. And so to kind of tease out this point and to take it a little bit further, I want to suggest that an active network of support can come in the form of friends and family, marches or demonstration, and increasingly online friendships or communications through social media or email. So active should be pretty familiar to us in terms of communicating, especially online. Now, by passive or indirect network of support, I'm, I'm thinking about someone who's not participating in dialogue, but might be reading extremist material online, simply being radicalized by events or by mainstream media reportage. No less, no less a part of these communities of support, and they're invariably present for lone wolves, which I would suggest 
at least in Europe and the United States, a necessary feature of that is now uh, uh, the internet. You cannot, I, I would put it in a negative, it's almost impossible to be a lone wolf terrorist without the use of the internet in Europe and the United States. And again, with the caveat that the person or persons forming this network, this community of support, again, have no operational role in the necessary self-directed terrorist cycle attacks. They might be cheerleaders, they might be people who are motivating, but they're not helping with the actual terrorist cycle. They're not uh, helping surveil targets. They're not helping uh, uh, to under undertake uh, plans of attack, for example. So again, a couple of other characteristics here against so-called lone wolf terrorism. The key point to take away, no organized terrorist group, an individual <coughs> acting alone, even if they're motivated by a number of different features, which I'll talk about. So in pursuing this idea of active and passive communities of support, I want to focus on a, a qualitative example of each that's drawn from my experience in testifying for the CPS here in the last a decade or so. Um, in both cases, what I'd really like to do is discuss, um, this is the most recent case that I took part in uh, last month, um, so you can't really see the top there, it says neo-Nazi terrorists caught with list of Scottish mosques and bomb making gear. Uh, so again, uh, depending on how question and answers go, we might talk about some of these more recent cases, uh, although they're not formally part of this uh, paper. All of these cases were, were individuals apprehended before <coughs> attempting their attacks, and when their property were, was seized, their writings clearly indicated that they were neo-Nazis in, in much the way that Bernhard has uh, very rightly, I think, set out. And it was this neo-Nazi context from which, in this case, these middle-aged, working-class white males emerged. But my point is that one appeared very connected to this network of support indirectly, while the other was much more directly uh, uh, dialoguing with a, a group that he had in fact co-founded called the Aryan Strike Force. But first let me turn to this individual named Neil Lewington, arrested near Reading on the 30th of October 2008 while changing trains on his way to a blind date that he had met online. He was drunk, allegedly urinating in public and hurling abuse at a female train conductor who then called the police. Upon being detained and searched, the police found two viable explosive devices on his person, uh, which apparently he was going to use to impress his blind date. <laughs> Seriously. Lewington was arrested at his home, in, and then they searched his home in Tylehurst near Reading under Section 18 of the Political and Criminal Evidence Act 1984. And according to, I'm sorry to say, Daily Mail, authorities found a, quote, bomb-making factory, including shrapnel bombs, disguised in tennis balls from which he planned to hurl into the homes of Asian families. They also, again quoting the Daily Mail here, found drawings of electronics and a cocktail of explosive ingredients including weed killer, fire lighters, firework powder, electrical timers, and detonators. Lewington also kept video footage about bombings in Britain and America, as well as fascist literature. And here's the point that I found most interesting or most curious a handbook that was called the Waffen SS UK Members Handbook, which he wrote himself. Claiming they had 30 members, dotted around experts in all sorts of terrorist things, all made up, all completely imaginary. Now, I was provided scans of this 18 page of Waffen SS UK Members Handbook, which contained no other references to this World War II paramilitary force, which uh, by the end of the Second World War had grown to, I think, a, a million members and 38 divisions. I was also provided scans that fell into three groups of material. Uh, <laughs> images taken from this person's phone, writings taken from his notebook uh, and, and his person upon arrest, and third, a black folder that contained uh, texts relating to bomb making, as well as newspaper clippings, taken from his bedside drawer. Now remember this person was arrested in 2008. Almost the entirety of the notebook clippings were themselves taken from the weeks after 9-11. And they were very much focused on uh, uh, the uh, uh, attack on Af Afghanistan. Uh, almost as a radicalizer, almost as a, uh, this is what we need to be doing. Okay? Uh, it may have been very much a radicalizing event for this anti-Muslim extremist. So the CPS asked me to analyze the first three types of material, that is, this member's handbook, uh, these phone images, and various notebook entries, and it was with respect to the following. So, 
This was what the CPS asked me to look like. Look at. Pretty straightforward, the first two, which were yes and no, respectively, uh, emphasizing the non-mainstream nature of universal Nazism or neo-Nazism. But more interestingly, maybe more perplexingly, in terms of the third question, fitting neo Lewington into the extreme right wing. Of course, it depends on what we define as the extreme right wing. Uh, this is not the BNP that we're talking about, radical right uh, and extreme, though they may be. But to define that in or out depended upon a specific content analysis of the hundred or so pages of writings and the dozen images provided to me by uh, counterterrorism police. So of these, let's call it hundred or so pages, much of this material was banal, which I know it, you use that term as well. It's a strange term to use, but some of it is very much everyday stuff, even within the context of being a deeply upsetting and extremist, of course. Shopping lists, train timetables, but also a number of things that we might say is like racist jokes of the crude one-liner variety. Most of these jokes were anti-Semitic, uh, many were anti-black or anti-Muslim in nature. Uh, from this list, I selected seven items and linked to one of two, and found that they were linked to one of two post-war fascist movements. Uh, four of them were linked to Combat 18, which again, uh, you'll see there, uh, comes up also in the most recent case, or Blood and Honor, so-called. And three of them were to the Christian identity, or Ku Klux Klan. Uh, as many of you will know, the KKK, as it's called, was found in, uh, founded in 1865, following the defeat of the Confederacy in the American Civil War, and had offshoots very quickly, uh, uh, almost like franchises across the Deep South, uh, and amongst uh, many other uh, hatreds, of course, first and foremost was... was uh, 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 a desire to retain slavery and a hatred of African Americans in, uh, in the South. One of the earliest of these KKK franchises was called the White Chameleonites of the KKK, founded as early as 1867 and said to have rivaled the main KKK in membership figures in the past. <coughs> this movement here was explicitly referred to in Lewington's notes, and as you can see, the images here, uh, the cover, the messenger, the uh, uh, Celtic cross with the, with the red teardrop, the blood teardrop, and also the statement from Mark 838, all on the phone. And there's only one place, to my knowledge, that brought all these together, this homepage. Now this was unusual, I think, at first, not least because of the, the, the St. Luke's Gospel, which was in Lewington's notes, but it was clear that they all derived from this webpage, or clear enough, I think, uh, certainly for the jury. The movement, uh, this movement here, had reformed uh, about 25 years ago and it, under the banner of Christian identity. I'm not going to say too much about it. It's a, a, a truly bizarre uh, view, believing that there were actually dual seed lines and that Jews were actually from outer space. Uh, I mean, it's um, truly unbelievable, these guys. Um, but that, that uh, uh, basically white people were the true children of God and the 12th lost tribe of Israel. So they will oftentimes use the phrase Israel, uh, but in a deeply anti-Semitic sense. It's some um, truly bizarre things. Um, in the words of Martin Durham, Christian identity is an in-American creation, and it appeals to both the religious identity of most American extreme rightists, the context of religiosity in America, and to their belief that not only they or the white race, but America is special. It is God's chosen place. This belief is predicated on an apocalyptic worldview, quote, holding that Jews are not only satanic, but represent a separate genetic seed line from Aryan people. That is, they are not humans. With the latter representing, as I mentioned, the lost tribe of Israel. Um, and again, this is not just the USA in question and answer time. We might talk about other more recent cases of Christian identity, including closer to home. It's not just an American phenomenon. But to put this simply, uh, Christian identity is a racist bastardization of Christianity, and it's hosted, uh, spawned a host of extreme right-wing groups, even just focusing on those in the United States, the Aryan Nations in the 1970s, under the Christian identity pastor Richard Butler, the Posse Comitatus movement, the Phineas Priesthood, and a number of uh, activists associated with the militia or survivalist movement. These guys are very dangerous, very violent. According to the specialist Michael Barkin, Christian identity clearly believes that the last days are imminent, a characteristic shared with most millennialists in contemporary America. 
And these views, in turn, I'm going to keep this up for as long as I can, uh, readily apparent on this group's website. There you can see the Christian identity uh, ideas, uh, especially there at the bottom, how to join. In the last decade, um, even though the KKK in the 1920s was at its peak with millions of members, many of them very, very influential politicians in America, um, the movement has, has shrunk to the several thousands, and the internet has become the KKK's main recruiting ground, which obviously means, in turn, that it is no longer just limited to the United States. There are a number of KKK groups, if you can believe it, in this country. And it was a, this small band of online white supremacists that formed one of the two strands of Lewington's indirect network of support. The other strand was not imported from the United States, but I think the most important domestic neo-Nazi export in this country, so-called Blood and Honor. Uh, the name Blood and Honor was taken from the inscription on Hitler Youth Daggers, forgive my pronunciation, Blut und Er, created, uh, um, and that was given to members who, who uh, gra graduated from the young Volk at the age of 14 to go into the Hitler Youth proper. They all had Hitler Youth daggers that said, uh, in German, blood and honor on the blade. Uh, the movement Blood and Honor was actually created by the ex-National Front member Ian Stewart Donaldson, the lead singer of a group called uh, Screwdriver. Um, and one of the earliest kind of, I think, populist countercultural ideas, there was uh, uh, at that point Rock Against Racism in the 1980s that some of you old enough might, might remember. They came up with Rock Against Communism, which started the long kind of germination of the Blood and Honor Network in the late 80s. And by the time of his death in 1993, uh, uh, Stuart Donaldson had launched the White Noise CD label called ISD Records, which was created to disseminate white power music, really one of the most important um, cultural undertakings of, of neo-Nazism in this, in this country. Um, one of the images that we see from that that uh, was, was on Neil Lewington's phone, 100% white, 100% proud, was one of the kind of the well-circulated slogans from these groups of white supremacists. During the 1990s, this movement merged with and indeed became virtually ex uh, in ex indistinguishable from Combat 18, the, the numbers 18 referring to the alphabet, one being an A and eight being a H, so combat Adolf Hitler. That was formed in 1992 as a sort of a bodyguard paramilitary unit for the British National Party. It divorced itself, it sort of split off from that movement, rejected the electoral op uh, opportunism of the BNP in favor of perpetuating paramilitary violence um, and a, a, a lot of football hooliganism in particular and advocated a policy of violent direct action. So again, Combat 18 like Christian identity, much very active, very violent, very overtly revolutionary, especially in inciting racial hatred and political violence. Uh, members of Combat 18 had targeted uh, Asian, other ethnic minorities in Britain, while openly identifying with Nazism and anti-Semitism. Um, and so reflecting on this, the journalist Nick Ryan, affiliated with Hope Not Hate, uh, sort of went around with him in the 1990s, and I think he, he put it about as succinctly as possible. Reality on the ground for Combat 18 was football violence in the far-right music scene. But here's my point of this first sort of overview of British neo-Nazism. In Lewington's case, there was no evidence whatsoever he had direct contact with Combat 18 activists. There was no evidence that he had attended racist or skinhead gigs, had been a football hooligan, no suggestion that he had any operational assistance whatsoever. A loner, this person who had turned his own bedroom into a so-called bond factory, lived with his parents and hadn't spoken to his father in 10 years. I don't even know how that's possible if you're like in the morning going, I need to go to the toilet or something like that. But this is who we're talking about, true loner in that sense. Like Brevik's Imagine Knights Templar, Lewington's Waffen SS uh, so-called command council was entirely, it looks like, entirely fictitious. Even though he claimed it had 30 members split into two men's cells, there was no sense that he had been in touch with anyone. The attempt to, in Lewington's own terminology, start a race war was therefore totally imagined. More to the point, it was wholly derived from his indirect network of support by surfing the web, 
checking out Combat 18 websites, Ku Klux Klan websites, and what have you. Now, I think to underscore this point, and for me, this was the main um, piece of evidence in the trial that I found, was Lewington's handbook in his, uh, in his Waffen SS notebook had this statement of intent. No longer will the weaklings rule the white man by lies and deceit, but the warrior will make his comeback and rule by strength, honesty, and love for his race. Now, this statement originally uh, uh, derives from Ian Stewart Donaldson, and it's contained in a very hard-to-get Samadzat publication called the Ian Stewart Songbook, and it's from 2001. But here, to me, is the really key point. The original is different from the above in one very small aspect. If you look at the, the commas after, before and after the <coughs> word but, that is not in the original songbook, but it was in, instead added on the homepage of Combat 18, Blood and Honor. And I think that that means that in the case of Neil Lewington, he was getting this only online rather than physically. And again, getting something like a, a neo-Nazi songbook is difficult to get through traditional channels. You'd have to order it, it'd have to be sent to you in some sort of Semizat, uh, uh, um, a publishing format and uh, envelope and so forth. So we can therefore conclude that in the case of Lewington, his network of support was online, including teaching himself bomb-making techniques. All the evidence I saw suggested that he was a lone actor radicalized by websites and racist fantasies almost wholly indirectly, by which I mean there was no evidence presented of trial of any dialogue, two-way communication amongst fellow right-wing extremists. Lewington was convicted in July 2009 of seven of eight terrorism-related charges and handed an indefinite sentence in September of that year after being told by the judge you were in the process of embarking upon terrorist activity designed to intimidate non-white people in Britain, and it was for the purpose of pursuing the ideological cause of white supremacy and neo-fascism. So my first example is someone who's clearly, or I would argue, passive. They are passively reading things online and being radicalized. Okay, now I'm going to show you the exact opposite. Also including the cause of so-called white supremacy, Ian Davidson, the individual on the left, was at the very opposite end of the spectrum in terms of these communities of support. Davidson was a founding member of the so-called Aryan Strike Force, the Aryan the name rather a giveaway in terms of their uh, racist values, which he had launched with the person on the right, his son Nicky, underage at the time, and launched in conjunction with two older neo-Nazis, Trevor Hannington, based in North Wales, and Michael Heaton, based in Wigington, Wigan excuse me, in the northwest of England. Now, at its peak, this movement, the Aryan Strike Force, purportedly had up to 350 virtual members worldwide, with perhaps two dozen activists carrying out paramilitary style, what they called street ops, to earn membership. On the left, Davidson using the avatar Sweeney 88, again, the 8's referring to the H and the alphabet, so Heil Hitler. Ian Davidson was in charge of propaganda, in which he was assisted by his son, who posted under the name Thorber. Now, for a year, this is their sort of mission statement here, done by Ian Davidson. I'll leave it up for uh, a few minutes. For a year, this quartet operated the Aryan Strike Force website. Its server located in Ohio to avoid hate crimes or incitement charges in the UK, before a falling out led to Heaton's departure from the group and the latter's founding of a much smaller group called the British Freedom Fighters, a uh, sort of splinter group. The three remaining Area Strike Force committee members then rebranded so called their larger organization as Legion 88, or Legion Heil Hitler, stroke the Wolf Pack. Here's a fair summary of their views. Uh, contained in an ASF, or Air and Strike Force, official statement posted by Davidson in January 2009. I'm not going to, uh, to focus on it too much, but you can see the reference to Zog is Zionist occupied government or occupational government, uh, the idea that, again, Jews are controlling everything. It is a classic neo-Nazi trope. Now, following a covert internet investigation, Ian Davidson was arrested in June 2009 shortly after the Wolf Pack's YouTube site uploaded videos of two pipe bombs being detonated. Concerning enough, though that was, and they were powerful pipe bombs, it was dwarfed 
by the findings at Ian Davidson's burn-up field home near Durham, a jar of ricin, which contained up to a dozen lethal doses of the biotoxin, one of the most lethal made from castor beans on Earth. It seems Davidson had purchased the castor beans online, then used easily sourced online paramilitary manuals to turn this into castor oil, the precursor of rice in one of the world's most deadly substances. When Davidson was caught, the so-called, uh, just to, to give you a sense of, to me, the scale of this, the sort of red line that was caught, the so-called Coalition of the Willing was still in Iraq trying to locate weapons of mass destruction that, were now, that now could be built, if not weaponized, with a dispersal agent, a self-directed terrorist needing access to only an internet connection and a credit card. This then was a brave new world whereby a working class milkman with self-taught computer knowledge and a belief in universal Nazism could seem to single-handedly cross the threshold of WMD. I say seem to because, like Lewington, Davidson was wholly unwilling to speak to the authorities upon his arrest, a, a, a huge contrast with the narcissistic Brevik or other lone wolves. Yet there was no su suggestion, again, that Davidson shared his bombing plans or preparations with other members of the Aryan Strike Force or its successor organizations, even including his son. Now, to be sure, all members of the Aryan Strike Force had access to paramilitary manuals, as you can see there, uh, posted by the head of the so-called U.S. Division, uh, talking about the latest tactical training manuals. Now, not to be outdone, as you can see on the bottom, by the end of 2008, Davidson had personally uploaded 21 book-length texts to the ASF website, including Mein Kampf, White Power, in addition to a number of the, the following manuals, which are clearly can be used in the pursuance of terrorism. This was a very small portion of the material I was asked to inspect uh, by the CPS. Unlike the scans that had been provided in the Lewington trial, this took the form of CD-ROMs containing films and images, online books, lots of links, public blogs, and private messages. Uh, these were presented in 2009 along with the following remit. Whereas my witness testimony in the Lewington case had been made uh, challenging by a dearth of material, a dearth of communication, here's the opposite challenge, an almost unimaginable volume of material. Thousands of posts that contained all manner of racist hatred, incitement to violence, and aggressive expressions of neo-Nazism. Yet in this context, the trials against the membership committee of the Aryan Strike Force offered a very rare opportunity to see the workings of what we heard earlier might be considered a neo-Nazi groupuscule. Now, I'm not going to focus on that, but we're talking about 52 discs worth of material that I broke into four categories. Uh, glorification of Nazism, violent racist and anti-Semitic language, propaganda, uh, dissemination, and international links with right-wing extremists. And the fourth, uh, materials towards paramilitarism and physical attacks. And I just want to have a conclusion, I hope about five minutes, uh, um, regarding this would-be ricin attacker. Now again, here's my point. In stark contrast to Neil Lewington, and indeed Brevik and others more recently, like Darren Osborne, Dylan Roof uh, in the United States, Ian Davidson had a very active network of support, daily exchanges online, an organization he helped to lead for some 18 months, an underage son who appeared, at least at that time, to share the same values. So this raises an unusual proposition. A would-be lone wolf who was passively collecting information on terrorist attacks while at the same time cultivating a very active network of support via the so-called Aryan Strike Force. There seem to be other important contrasts between, excuse me, Davidson and, uh, on the one hand, and those more passively drawing upon these international, as you can see there, networks of support, flags from Australia, uh, Finland, and Scotland. And um, just to kind of move on to some of the materials that were being trafficked, I just want to uh, highlight, for example, general threats of violence to far more violent expressions that had been advanced by Lewington online. Comments were sometimes directed at individuals alongside, in at least one instance, circulating a, a, a police officer's home address. 
Amongst a motley crew of online racists, in fact, it turned out that Davidson most consistently, or, or was the most extreme, consistently in the use of violent expressions and threats. Uh, to give you just a final example, his violent language doubtless brought attention to himself for anyone monitoring the Aryan Strike Force website. In fact, some of these are so disgusting, I'm not going to read them out. They're really upsetting stuff. Um, yet it was more than just talk in Davidson's case. Reflecting on, for example, the Aryan Strike Force training days in Cumbria that he helped to organize, he declared, our paramilitary are picking up the pace. And in still another one, for example, he says, I've worked on some germ warfare plans in the past, but as always, lacking resources were the biggest obstacle. To my mind, in and of itself, these are, I think, clearly arrestable offenses. But keyboard warriors and other fantasists make these kinds of horrible and offensive statements all the time online, too much so, and not just on neo-Nazi forums. Surely this has to be, of course, balanced, the idea of going in and breaking up a forum like that, against the cost of compromising surveillance that may have been going ongoing for months or even years. It also poses a challenge when policing right-wing extremists who are actively engaging with their network of support. For example, how do investigators know who is all talk and who is a legitimate security threat? How does one separate the rhetoric of many aggressive writers of online texts to those like Davidson or others that we've seen who deserve to be tried in the court of law. My final paragraph, you'll be pleased to know. Davidson ultimately pled guilty to six terrorism-related charges and remains to this day the only person in the UK convicted under the 1996 Chemical Weapons Act. Having served most of his sentence, I believe that he's recently been remanded on bail and will be shortly returned to a world where self-directed or lone wolf terrorism and what I've even termed broadband terrorism that is, using the internet as part and parcel of the so-called terrorist cycle, has become much more common, not less. And that raises the question about what we're going to do about it. Thank you very much.